the larger world, not just in. Hi, my name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I am a addictions physician working out of Toronto, Canada. And today I'd like to talk about the biology of spirituality. Please check out my other videos where I do one on the biology of addiction in general. I do another one on the biology of recovery and this one on the biology of spirituality in recovery, because I believe that spirituality is really important for long-term recovery from addiction. I've worked with clients over the years, and it's always impressed me that the people who tend to do the best long-term have some concept of spirituality. It might be a sense of meaningfulness, it could be an actual belief in God. It doesn't have to be an actual religious practice, but something that they value outside of themselves. Maybe it's the universe, maybe it's their family. Some value outside of themselves is a really good indication of long-term success, of good, healthy, vibrant recovery. Now this graph shows a composite of a number of studies, and it highlights what I'm saying that use severity goes up in time dependent on the level of the person's spiritual well-being. Well-being can mean anything from an actual relationship with God, just satisfaction with life, and a sense of purpose in life. Now we know that life is hard. There are a lot of trials that happen through life. Even Buddha says life is suffering. So we need to have something to pull us out of that mindset that in a day there's a lot of dreariness, there's sometimes even suffering. What will uplift us out of that? We have heard the term, the opposite of addiction is connection. What are we connected to? It could be to people around us or it could be to some generalized other. In fact, philosophers have called spirituality relationship with a generalized other. We are social beings, and if we don't have social venues immediately in our environment, we can build a social platform, a generalized other that we speak to. Even an introvert, somebody who doesn't like to be with a lot of people, still values connection. It's connection with a few people, not a whole crowd of people, but it's still a few people. And it might be a connection with an author or the protagonist in a book that they're reading. They're following the action of the lead character, wanting to know what's next, probably having some sort of conversation in their head with the author or with the protagonist. That's still a connection of sorts. So addiction is the opposite. It's not connection, it's, it's disconnect. Addiction, in short, is the compulsive engagement in repetitive behavior despite negative consequences. You keep doing something repeatedly over and over despite the fact that you're having negative consequences and you can't stop. Now that causes a disconnect because you can't be connected with yourself or with a generalized other. And spirituality is the opposite of addiction. It is a connection with something other than yourself. The self-will run riot, which we say in the 12-step program, self-will is paramount. Spirituality is not self-will. It is the greater will, the other will, not necessarily a higher power, but a different power, a different perspective. When a person comes into treatment, they are so overwhelmed with behaviors focused on themselves. This is not because the person's selfish, it's because the addiction, I guess you could say the addiction has made the person selfish, but it's not because they are inherently selfish. I don't believe any of us are inherently selfish when we are in extreme addict mode or anxious mode or fear mode. When you quiet that drive to tend to the self, it has to be replaced by something. There is an inherent need in all of us to connect out of ourselves to something other than ourselves so that we're part of the larger environment. And that's where spirituality is. Because addicts have been so focused on themselves, they may not have learned the tools to move out of themselves. The whole practice of spirituality 
gives us tools to move outside of ourselves through meditation, through connection with others, through prayer, through service, through just a belief in something other than myself. I'm not going to tell you all about the various spiritual practices that exist. That's a universe of, of books, of discussions. What I am going to talk about today is the biology behind spirituality, behind those practices, why those practices work. At the time, long ago, I would look at things like meditation and prayer and roll my eyes and go, that's for them, that's not for me. I don't need that because I'm doing other things that are fulfilling me and they're just fine, thank you very much. And then when those things didn't give me everything that I needed, I was at a loss at what to do because I still had this need to connect. I didn't know how to do that. I had rejected many of the practices that people do, like yoga, meditation, going to church, prayer, reading spiritual books, going to spiritual practices of various sorts. And I started to see the biology behind those things, even if those things in and of themselves don't have any factual basis for them. Like, how can you prove that God exists? One thing that we do know is that when a person has a spiritual practice, good health and good mental health are the result. That's what I want to talk about today. What's the biology behind those behaviors? You're probably doing many of them already, but what you may not know is why they are actually working. Because I'm an addictions physician, I cannot get away with me not mentioning the 12-step program. This is essentially the spiritual program built just for addiction, and that can be addiction to alcohol. It started with Alcoholics Anonymous, but now we have Cocaine Anonymous, we have Narcotics Anonymous, we have Overeaters Anonymous, we have Sex Anonymous, Sex and Love Anonymous. We have so many different types of addictions that can be addressed by the 12-step program that it really warrants a mention. The 12-step program started by Bill W. and Dr. Bob in 1934, and their book, Alcoholics Anonymous, was published in 1939, and since then it took off. There are certainly other recovery programs like smart recovery but these are not spiritual based and often they try to be an alternative to a spiritual practice they're very useful i would say use them all the 12-step program is premised on step one which is i admitted that i'm powerless over alcohol and and my life became unmanageable so step one is you put down the drink, but you notice there's 12 steps. Really, the first three steps are about putting down the drink. The rest of the steps are about how do I stay stopped. It's not about the alcohol or the drug anymore. How do I disentangle all that self-will that I've been living with for all these years and find the essence of who the real self is that wants to be connected. The 12 step is, helps you find that. You'll notice if you look very closely, it resembles very many principles that any spiritual program has. First of all, it's very much focused on being honest and open and willing. It's recognizing once you put down the drink, what is it that often makes people pick up the drink again. It's their self-will that's run riot, has made a mess of their life. Steps four and five are a way to find out what are the things that I've done that have made a mess of my life or other people have done to me that have made me pick up a drink. Steps four and five, and can I acknowledge those and make an intent to change them? We see this in a lot of spiritual programs. In fact, step four and five is very much like confession in the Catholic tradition, some sort of owning up to your own issues and telling somebody else. Then there's a desire to change overall defects of character. That's the terminology that was used many years ago. Now we'll use just defaults or neural templates that are solidified. Can we now make an intent to change our behavior so that those neural templates will change so that when something is upsetting, I don't immediately get angry or I don't immediately accuse people or I don't immediately do something that's not very helpful to the situation. Once you've done that, you go and you try to actually change those behaviors, not just confessing. If you actually have done injury to someone else, to go and apologize or make restitution. And then finally, after that cleaning house, as it were, focus that every day you try to do some mini version of that throughout the day. You've basically done a, a 
therapy on yourself and made some changes. You'll see this in many spiritual programs and including a lot of therapeutic programs. Finally, after that, you make a commitment that you're going to help another person because we have found that when you serve others, it is as effective as if somebody is serving you. It's just as effective. And we'll often say when a person is down and out, go and help somebody else because you're essentially helping yourself. By going back out, you feed yourself. That's the 12 step program. And that is many other spiritual programs. I just wanted to say that there has been research talking about the effectiveness of 12-step programs in addiction. Yes, there is also research to show the effectiveness of smart recovery and cognitive therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy, but those are not spiritual programs. Unfortunately, because it's an anonymous program and it makes it very difficult to study when people can't actually identify themselves as subjects in the study. but. The research that has been done has shown that there are good out outcomes. The more you go to a meeting, the better your likelihood of success and recovery is. The more you have a sponsor, the more you do the 12 step work, the more you're actually participating in the mechanics of the meetings. These are all acts that have shown value. Even the person wasn't aware that this was going to help their mental and physical health. Some research was done in the eighties or nineties, and it shows that the level of success depending on how frequently the person goes to a meeting. You can see that on the side closest to me over here, weekly, that's the best success. And the person who does nothing in terms of a spiritual program has lesser success. They'll still have some success because the person that has the intent to quit and is able to quit. We don't know for how long though. You'll see that over the course of a year to three years, AA attendance or a spiritual program attendance is the third one, it's the gray in each of the bars. So at one year, it's not the highest, but it's pretty high. It's certainly higher than the darkest, which is nothing. And then it carries through into eight years, long-term sobriety. And you'll notice there's a white that's even bigger. This is this one here and over here, this one. This is actually where there's a combination of a spiritual program like AA and outside program like cognitive behavioral therapy or dbt or just a counselor so having both actually will get you the furthest but the point is that you do the best when you have a spiritual program attached to it a lot more research out there that shows that people who have higher religious or spiritual attendance behaviors in their life do better mentally and physically lots of research to show that a person Blood pressure will go down, their post-surgical complications are less, they overall do better. With anxiety management, there's less depression, there's less obsessive compulsive behavior. Just across the board, having a spiritual practice of some sort is mentally and physically healthy. I don't want to get into all of that because I want to focus on addiction. There was a very good study called the Cochrane Review of AA. The Cochrane Review is an independent study of a number of issues that are not typically studied because there is no pharmaceutical interest in this or some industrial interest. Often these are questions like, does AA work? Because who's going to fund a piece of research like that? But this group did, and they took numerous studies across the world and compared them. They did a large scale study where they compared no spiritual practice versus AA. And they found that AA in almost every level either was the same as other practices or better in reducing drinking and in stopping drinking and in maintaining long-term sobriety. You can find out more information about the Cochrane Review on YouTube for free. It's an excellent 20 minutes of your time. So now let's talk about the definition of religion versus spirituality. So religion is a set of beliefs, behaviors that people follow. Spirituality may include religion, but it doesn't need to. It is that reaching out of ourself. There are some people who have said, what is this thing that we should call this? In the old days, we called it just philosophy, theology. It was this trying to understand in the various ways how we can move outside of ourselves. And that can be through belief or through behavior or just through the larger 
belief in the universe almost seems like in our human being there is a thirst for something other than ourselves in fact some people will say including myself that addiction is often a thwarted strong urge to move outside of myself that's why a person will use a drug or will use a drink because they're trying to get out of the insanity of their own mind and move into the larger realm addiction it ironically doesn't last for very long and the person deflates back and gets stuck into themselves but there seems to be this urge to move out and what is that about so some people have actually tried to research this and try to explain this one explanation is it genetic it does appear to be that the d4 receptor which is the same receptor is impaired with addiction is there something about the d4 receptor genetically that predisposes a person to addiction yes there is we found that is there also something that explains the d4 receptor which might explain innate optimism and a tendency towards spiritual thinking yes it appears to be that there is this is the d4 receptor there's been some research on the serotonin 1a receptor gene also implicated with the sense of self transcendence could some people have a more triggerable serotonin a1 receptor or have more of an abundance than someone else it's quite possible finally there's been research about twin studies showing that as many as 60% of twins have a similar spiritual perspective even when they've been reared apart there's something genetic here i will certainly say this is not genetic anymore this is just out there in the world that in my experience clinically that when people come for treatment for addiction they often have a craving for something we call it the hole in the donut there's a craving for something other than themselves which i would say is a spiritual thirst us genetics and using itself there seems to be a tendency towards spirituality and if we want to stop the opposite of addiction is connection which in the context of what i'm talking about today is spirituality because what are we connecting to but to something other than ourselves now let's look at some of the biological mechanisms behind this thirst and how to fill it i'm going to talk about three different dimensions that will explain biologically why spirituality feeds the recovering addict mind the first thing i want to talk about is the left brain right brain the divided brain because this i think explains probably 70% of the power of spirituality our brain is divided and we have this strip of corpus callosum in the middle and in the frontal lobe the left brain and the right brain brain is involved with our thinking capacity because our frontal lobe is where our thinking our higher order thinking exists what's the difference between left brain and right brain i'm just going to summarize this here but do go on the internet and you can do all sorts of quizzes to find out if you're more left brain or right brain the left brain is the logical side it's the a equals b equals c it's the 1 plus 2 equals 3 it's consecutive it's linear it's practical it's strategic it's control focused so if you're a control freak that means you're in your left brain it's the realistic part of the person it's action oriented the right brain on the other hand is the not linear not logical thinking not thinking inside the box but thinking outside of the box thinking non-linear illogical it's intuitive it's imaginative it's metaphorical i can give you an instruction by saying you got to do this and then this i'm giving you the facts or i can tell you an instruction by giving you a story for example, when a person gets up in an AA meeting, they have a formula which is called the story of this is what happened, this is what I did to change, and this is how I am now. That is a parable, that is a metaphor. 
It's like the difference between giving a written instruction versus showing by example. I want to say that all of us have both sides of the brain, but some of us tend to be more dominant than the other. So people who are more dominant left thinkers are more rational. These are the accountants, the military, the rule bound individuals who go, I do this, then I do this, then I do this, and then I have a solution versus the right brain dominant people who are the artists, the poets, the musicians, the people who live intuitively. These are the people who are great counselors because they know how to listen. They know intuition. You read the body language, you get the feel of things. That's right brain. When you're in the left side of the brain, there is a certain expectation of control. The right side of the brain is very free flowing and there's not very much control that's possible there because the focus of control means you have to rein in things and organize them and that's left brain thinking. An important feature to know about this left brain and right brain is that the left brain is a closed system. This is the part of my brain that requires information that I sequence into behavior. I don't have time to take in new information when I'm trying to figure something out. It's just going to confuse things. It's a very closed system that uses information that's already in my memory banks. The right brain is not focused on control. It's free floating. It's free association. It's lateral thinking. It absorbs new information as much as possible. Give me as much new as possible. This is where genius comes from. Because what is genius? Genius isn't about something new. It's taking information that's already there and seeing it in a different way. That's genius. Einstein, who was a physicist and wrote E equals MC squared, formulas to understand the universe that's so large or so small that we can't see it. We have to actually use numbers to conceptualize it. You'd think he would be a left brain person because numbers and formulas is a left brain activity. But he had the unusual, uncanny ability to imagine something, imagination, right brain, that took the information that he had and saw it in a different way. That is right brain. That is genius. And when Einstein died, sure enough, we found that his brain was slightly more enhanced than his left brain. Not a surprise. The left brain is a closed system to take information and the right brain is open. Guess where spirituality sits? It has to sit in the right brain. It's open. It's soaking in. It's moving outside of myself. The left brain is moving into self so that I can figure out what to do next. The right side, I don't need to do anything. I'm just sitting, imagining things intuitively. Then when I have to actually go and act on it, I've got to get up from the park that I've been daydreaming, go and write out my plan of action, which is the left brain spirituality is housed in the right brain. Now, what happens to somebody who lives in the left brain all the time? Because either addiction or just personality, they are rational and they don't want to do that like I did. They don't want to go and do that airy fairy stuff. The right brain has no ability to inform them. And this is important. The other thing I want to say about this closed and open system is that you can't have both of them operating at their maximum at the same time. That would be too difficult because they're contrary to each other. So usually one is on and the other is off. So when I am writing and trying to figure something out, I'm not really able to access my imaginative mind. When I'm being imaginative, I can't really be action oriented at that moment. There's always one on more than the other. When you're under stress, when you see something and you go, oh my God, something's happening, you immediately go to left brain because left brain is action oriented. What do I know now? I don't have time to think about new ideas. I have to go with what I know and I have to behave. Here's the stimulus. Here's my response. It's a sequential action. So left brain is dominant. Right brain sits in the back because it's not necessary. It's going to get in the way. Can you imagine if you're a person who's under stress all the time or you're in addict mind all the time, although you're trying to get to the right brain for relief, you're probably stuck more in the left brain. You're stuck there. And that's what we call a prison of some sort because you're stuck in the rules and regulations that you've created and you can't get out of them. And the right part of your brain is not able to inform you. 
to get out of the problems. Have you ever had the experience where you want to remember something or you know how to do something, but it just won't come to you at that moment. I'm not going to get up from the chair until I figure this out. And then you finally say, I just can't. And then you go out for a walk. There it is. I got it. You're out for that walk and you realize, oh, it just took 10 minutes. And there is the information that I was getting. It just plopped into your head. Why? Because it was in the right side of the brain. The right side of the brain could have been knocking at the door going, would you please stop with the thinking so that I can intuitively give you the information? Because often when you get that information, it isn't, oh, there's the answer. It's, ah, that's it. Okay. And then you can go back and with that new way of thinking, find your answer in the left brain. So the right brain has information. It's just as informative as the left side of the brain, but it is more passive, more fluid, very easy to dismiss it because it's not as action oriented. If you're action oriented, you're not going to listen to it. If you're stuck in left brain because of addiction or just personality or mental disorders like anxiety, where you just won't let go, then you're deprived of this right brain, which is another way of saying you're deprived of a spiritual intuitive experience. This is the part of the brain that opens us up. I see a lot of people when I am in my classes drawing things and they're not writing notes, they're drawing, they're making images or coloring in. I take no offense when they do that because I know what they're doing. They're in the right side of their brain and they're absorbing the information probably more than the one that's writing notes going the right side of the brain is much more open and absorbent. And that's where our spirituality sits. What we want to do with recovery is break the chains of the left brain, let flourish the right side of the brain. I'm not saying to go to the right side of the brain and stay there, but for God's sakes, open the windows, let the air in, let find out who you are, that other part of you that has just as much information and is actually the more wise part of our brain. And a spiritual practice will open that up. You do prayer, you do meditation, you do connection with others, all of these behaviors will enhance and flourish the right side of the brain. Some spiritual writers will say that the left side of the brain is like the little ego. And in the addiction world, this is our self-will versus the big ego, which is the right side of the brain. And the big ego, that is not me, but the rest of the world. In the AA program, people will use the term surrender. I surrender my will, which is just another way of saying, I'm going to close off or diminish the left brain and open up the right brain, surrender to the right brain. You're not actually surrendering to a God or to another person. You're just surrendering to another part of yourself, the wise part of yourself, the genius part of yourself. It's not frivolous. It's actually just as potent. It's more potent than the left brain. Really, we have made the argument that the left brain controls our behavior in society, but it should really be the right brain, be the dominant. I can use the phrase, the mind is a terrible master, but a wonderful servant. We should let the right brain be the master and use the left brain as a servant. But we don't. We often let the left brain, our thinking rational part, be the master. And that's what makes the mess of our lives. Interestingly, it is the reason why often people use drugs because they want to get to that right side, which ironically, the way that they're trying to get there has kept them into the left side of the brain. So you got to ditch that approach because it hasn't been working and now go right to the meditative prayer service, all of the spiritual approaches, because they will bring you to that right side of the brain. That appears to be very important for a person to maintain long term recovery. My guess is that when relapse happens, if it's not some resentment or some problem that's brought them back, it's because they're bored. It's that empty hole in the donut. They're searching for that right side of the brain and they're going to use drugs and alcohol, even though that doesn't get them there for very long. The second part of how spirituality works. Once we look beyond the divided brain, look at the limbic system itself. We have three parts of our brain. We have the bottom part of our brain, the brain stem at the back, what we would call the vegetative or reptilian part of our brain. It is the part of our brain that's the mechanics of living, breathing, digestion. I, I'm not thinking, it's just my brain doing its job. 
I could be alive. The person's in a hospital, maybe they're on a respirator to keep them breathing, but they're brain dead. Then we have the second part of our brain, the middle part called the limbic system, where our emotions are dominant. This is where our emotions and our motivation and our instincts sit. This part of our brain supports the lower part of our brain. So my instinct, which would be to run away from danger or move forward to positive life affirming behavior like food, friendship, sex. These are all things that sustain life. That's in the middle part of the brain. In the upper part of our brain up here, this is the sort of cap of the mushroom of the brain. And the front part is the frontal lobe. That is where our thinking is. This part of our brain is the finesse of being a human being. It is where I think, where I have compassion, forgiveness, all those tools of cooperation that our species has developed over the last thousands of years. And when you think about these three parts of the brain, there is an order of dominance. The lower part of the brain, which is right here, brainstem, as I was talking about, it has the most dominance because it has to. If I can't breathe, I'm dead. It has to be the most dominant. I might be thinking to myself, I'm not going to breathe because I'm so upset and I'm just going to hold my breath. I'm a little kid and I'm holding my breath until I die. I won't die because this part of my brain will eventually kick in. The oxygen is low, the carbon dioxide is high. We're going to have a reflex that will make us breathe whether we want to or not. It's dominant. The middle part of the brain is next dominant. This is where our fight, flight, freeze instinct kicks in. And it is far more powerful than my frontal lobe, the top part of my brain, which says, don't behave that way, that looks stupid. If I am that afraid or that angry, I'm going to do the stupidest thing because I'm trying to save my life. So in order of importance, it's the bottom, that's the most important, then the middle and then the top. So that my ability to be compassionate with somebody else when I'm upset is pretty low because I'm more concerned about myself because I'm highly triggered. If you're very upset, your ability to control your behavior goes down. And then the less upset you become, so this is starting to go down, the more you're able to control yourself. So you can be in control with not a lot of emotion, or you can be highly emotional and not very rational and not very controlled. Now the ideal might be to float around here, but when you're frightened, it's like this. And when you're super rational, it's like this. It's very difficult to be both at the same time equally. It's just simple biology. And addiction sits in the middle part of the brain where there is no control. It's all emotion because what's happening with addiction is when I'm upset, here I've got my substance, in this case it's coffee, but let's pretend it's something else. When I'm upset and I reach for this, the upset goes away. Then I've just learned this is my saving grace. And this becomes instinctually my saving grace. So the person who's using at a certain point will use despite negative consequences because in their mind, they are saving their life right now. Now, in five minutes, their life may not be saved because they've just spent the last $5 for food and rent and cigarettes. But in that moment, they behave despite negative consequences because they were saving their life. So addiction is actually a completely rational response to an abnormal learning. I've learned there's no reason why this should save my life, but I've learned that it has because this thing was so potent. And please read, please watch my video on the biology of addiction to explain this phenomena. It is so potent that I'm convinced I'm saving my life. This part of the brain is is dominant when I'm in addiction. The other part of my brain, the frontal lobe, is takes a back seat. Oh, I can't fight this monster. This is just too big. This is the reason why I love this diagram. This is our limbic system, and we want to soothe this savage beast. If this thing is running at me, I want to make nice. I do not want to scare it because that's only going to make things worse for me. It's the only way I'm going to be able to manage it is I'm going to make it nice. So addiction and recovery is about recognizing this is my addict and how can I soothe this? My job for the rest of my life is to soothe this savage beast. We have other terms. Some people call it the red dog. Some people call it the dictator. What they call their addict mind. It's there once it's been developed. Neurons are fired together, wired together. This phantom beast is now in your head. In the limbic system that has now been changed forever, 
this is my belief anyway, that once you're an addict, you're always an addict. And our goal now in recovery is to soothe this savage beast. And that's where spirituality sits. Just quickly to give you the terminology, that savage beast is the amygdala. The amygdala is a little panic button in that middle part of the brain, the limbic part of our brain, that when child sees something, they are frightened and immediately it goes to the amygdala as a warning. Oh my God, there's something here. Seconds later, it goes up to the prefrontal lobe to say, oh yes, there's somebody shouting, but they're not shouting at me. I don't need to be worried, but I'm already afraid by the loud noise. This is why people who are noisy and slamming doors or is even if it's not about you, you're jumping, you're, you're uncomfortable because your amygdala is kicked in before the frontal part of your brain, the rational part of your brain says, hey, don't worry about it, it's okay. You're already reacting. This reaction is a stress response. Please watch my video on the biology of recovery because I go into this at length. Just to say here that when I have a stress response, the part of my nervous system that houses the stress response is in the involuntary part of my nervous system. We have the sympathetic, which is the stress response, and the parasympathetic, which is the relaxation response. And those two are involuntary. So a loud noise will kick me into the stress response, which is right there, and all sorts of things will happen, which all are preparing me to run or fight or freeze. I can't get to the parasympathetic nervous system when the stress response is on. The parasympathetic is the relaxation response. That's the yawning. That's the feeling relaxed. That's the gurgling stomach and I'm hungry and I want to eat. I can't do any of that when I'm running for my life. So the stress response will kick in. An addiction pushes that amygdala, puts you into a stress response. It's again why we use paradoxically to stop that, but it actually makes it worse. Now, when I'm in stress response, I will do anything I can to stop that, to get over to this part of myself. And it will give this to me for a few minutes or maybe a few hours, and then it goes right back over to here again. So what we want to do with addiction is soothe the savage beast, which is part of this stress response, soothe it, and then go over to here and relax myself. And how am I going to do that? I'm going to do that by meditation, prayer, and other spiritual practices. When I am very stressed, many things are happening. My face is flushed, my heart is racing, my breathing is short. I'm basically, I'm trying to get as much oxygen as I can so that I can run and save myself. The parasympathetic, the relaxation response, that's when I take a deep breath because I'm relaxed. I'm not under stress. I'm safe. I'm chilled. I'm happy. I can relax. My heart starts to slow down. My breathing goes right down to my belly. Everything works well. I said this was an involuntary system, but there are ways indirectly to turn on the stress response and the parasympathetic relaxation response. The way to turn on the sympathetic response is to get the person anxious. Oh my God, you feel it in your belly and I know I have to have this. Oh my God, where is this? What am I going to do? The stress response mounts and mounts and I'm panting. Okay, if I put this away, I've got to find another way to turn that stress response down. One thing I can do is I can take a deep breath. Diaphragmatic breathing, that means that I'm breathing right into my belly. What's happening is the breathing goes right down to the diaphragm, which is right between the lungs and the abdomen. And there is a vagal nerve. It's the biggest nerve of the body. It is our relaxation response. So when I breathe, if I do 10 deep breaths, that's 10 times I'm starting to caress that nerve, as it were, that vagal nerve. I'm turning it on. It's like a dimmer switch light. That the light is really high because you're freaking out. Each breath brings it down a bit more. Now the stress is going down as I am turning on the relaxation response. So that's a way that I can indirectly put myself into relaxation mode. The person will say, I can't take a deep breath. It's impossible. I'm running for my life, for God's sake. You have to do actually say to them, okay, do it anyway. Do it anyway. And the behavior itself will gradually, incrementally, you will get into a relaxed mode. By the time you've done 10 minutes of deep breathing, you're more relaxed than you were 10 minutes ago. If you can do a whole hour, you are chilled. You're great. Remember that the stress response will always win out over the parasympathetic or relaxation response. I can't relax if a truck is coming at me. If I'm in a state 
like addiction where I've relaxed, but now this stuff is now wearing off. I'm going to lose that relaxation. And then I'm back into the stress mode and wanting to treat that stress. Stress is not meant to be an experience to be endured. This is why people don't like it. You feel this feeling that means run or fight or freeze. Do something for God's sakes. Don't sit there. What we're asking you to do in recovery is essentially sit there and turn on the person sympathetic response until finally that relieves itself. We want to tie these two things together. I was talking earlier, the divided brain and this part of our brain, which is the limbic system, that middle part of the brain is running the show. And my ability to say, you know, I don't have any control because I'm running for my life and get out of my way, please. Because that, that upper part of the brain cannot work. Basically what's happening is that the thinking capacity that I do have, which is get out of the way, I will punch your face in. If I st stand still like this, nobody will see me. That's the extent of my ability to think. And it is very specific to the individual. If this is what's worked in the past, this is what's going to work today. I can't take in new information. Remember left brain, right brain? When the left brain is dominant, the right brain sits back. And I don't have much of that. I don't have much of the top of my head working at all for I'm in the dominant limbic system, I don't have much control to think when I'm in my emotionality. Remember when the emotions are high, the thinking goes down. So whatever thinking is possible, it is very specific, it's very action oriented, and it's very left mind focused. There is no spirituality happening at this moment. It's all about, I know what to do next, which is thank you very much. How can I figure out how to stop this whole emotional storm that's happening in the middle part of my brain? first thing that you have to do in recovery is go through a period of what we call post-acute withdrawal, which is this biological phenomena of a sympathetic and left brain response dominant. You are focused on yourself and very routine patterns of behavior that have worked for you in the past. I feel bad, I use, and I am freaking out. You have to basically let that settle which takes two to three weeks. This is why we lock people up for 30 days in, in treatment centers, because we can't trust them to just sit through this emotional storm. But eventually the storm passes and things regulate and self adjust themselves so that the person is able to go, okay, they're not back to normal completely, but they're a little bit more normal. Their stress response is a little less because they've had some sleep. Their need for addictive drug is a little less potent. They're just feeling and they're just generally feeling a bit better. The other thing that's happening is they're starting to feel a little bit of hope. Sometimes we call it a pink cloud. What's happened is the right brain has finally gotten in there to say, hey, here I am. Because as that left brain is getting right-sized and the stress response is minimalizing, you've got the relaxation response here, which opens up the doorway to the right side and you start to feel better with more hope and more optimism. When a person is in recovery and they're starting to feel a little bit of hope, that right side of the brain is starting to act up. But there's another thing happening. It's not just the stress response and the divided mind interplay. There's also the neurochemicals, specifically serotonin. The opposite of addiction is connection. Addiction is dopamine enhanced and has just messed up the whole thing. We normally have dopamine that motivates us to get up out of bed in the morning and serotonin that puts us to bed at night. Dopamine, I want to get up and do things and I'm excited about all these things. Serotonin at the end of the day, I'm safe, I'm good, I've accomplished what I want to, I'm with my family, I'm feeling like I've done a good day's work. That's serotonin and that's supposed to be a nice interplay throughout the day, the yin and the yang of the day as it were. What happens with addiction is the dopamine is bloated out of proportion and the serotonin is so shriveled down or in relation to the dopamine, certainly. The person is feeling lonely, embarrassed, they hate themselves, they're sure other people hate them. It's that empty hole in the donut syndrome for sure. They just generally feel unsafe. They need their drug, they feel unsafe. So what we're trying to do with recovery is right size the dopamine, the stress response, the left brain and inflate the serotonin. And how do we do that? By giving a sense of safety 
and a sense of meaningfulness and fellowship. And don't those words sound like what you get when you are in a spiritual practice? Hope that what you see here is that it doesn't matter what you believe. If you are in fellowship, if you are given a sense of meaning, if you are given a sense of safety, of satisfaction, of accomplishment, of feeling good about yourself, that is all you need to get that right side of your brain working. It doesn't matter how you get there, but whatever you do, whatever spiritual, whatever religious doctrine you follow, if you follow the spiritual practices by deep breathing and by calming behavior, you're going to get to that right side of the brain, which is the spiritual side. It's serotonin that soothes the savage beast, along with mitigating or modifying or diminishing the stress response and putting you into a parasympathetic response. You want to get a lot of sense of connection. The opposite of addiction is connection. The opposite of dopamine impairment is serotonin enhancement. Here's some interesting findings from various research studies of mystical experiences. And you'll hear people in a 12-step program or in addiction will attribute their sustainable recovery to some mystical experience. Really what they're describing is that there's been a neurochemical adjustment. There's been a reset in the brain towards a more spiritual perspective. Mystical experiences, we found that there's an increase in dopamine in meditation. Now we're not talking about the inflated dopamine of addiction, but we do want to recover our natural neurochemicals. Addiction is not just stopping the drug and we got another 11 steps or a whole lifetime of recovery based behavior that will make life worth living. We want to recover. What are we recovering? Our neurochemistry, our right brain, our stress and relaxation response in the right proportions. So dopamine is a called upon because dopamine is our sense of excitement, curiosity, and newness. And a mystical experience is new and exciting, but not too much. So we see that in meditation. Good, because you want to recover that. We see that there's a decrease in stress hormones during meditation because you're doing the deep diaphragmatic breathing, turning on that relaxation response. We see that there's an increase in serotonin, which is that connection, that neurochemical of connection. And finally, another neurochemical is we see is an increase in oxytocin. Oxytocin is our neurochemical of love. This is the neurochemical that is inspired when you look at a baby, big head, big eyes, small body, there's something about that we love. We love little dogs. I have a little doggy that I just love to look at because she's got this big eyes that inspire my oxytocin. Cuddling and touching is an oxytocin response. We need touch. We need that kind of connection in spiritual experience. In summary, spirituality boosts serotonin and oxytocin. How do you get that? By gratitude to a gratitude list. I appreciate that's a nice flood of serotonin. Fellowship, more serotonin. It also gives you oxytocin, trust, and service. All of these things enhance serotonin and oxytocin. And with trust, you're only going to have trust if you feel safe, which means that your relaxation response is flourishing. Can you see how something like loving kindness, which is a Buddhist meditation, will actually check off all those boxes. You'll have kindness, which is oxytocin. You'll have loving, which is oxytocin. You'll have the connection, which is serotonin. The meditation itself, which is a breathing process of calm, safe, uplifting thoughts. This is all opening up that relaxation response and then letting you float in that world of the right brain which is not time centric and not rushed and not action based in short a uh, spiritual practice will open up a whole new world of recovery that has been denied to the addict while they were in active addiction so now i want to say a few words about spirituality and how it changes the brain. There is a part of the brain that's called the anterior cingulate in the frontal lobe of the brain. And it is the moderator of the limbic system and the frontal lobe. Remember the limbic system is bloated out when you're in addiction and frontal lobe is our willpower, logic, reason. This anterior cingulate's role is to moderate and keep it in balance as much as possible. We know that when an addict comes in, there is no balance. The limbic system is way up here, it's up and the frontal lobe is down. After 
after eight weeks of meditation, you can actually boost the anterior cingulate activity so that it can do more balancing. You'll notice here in this diagram, this is before meditation, up here that, that there's that's where the anterior cingulate is and it's dark. But if you notice after eight weeks of meditation, much darker, the role of it is much more. There is actually something happening when you are doing this breathing and meditating, whatever it takes to make you feel calm, deep breathing, that opens up the channels to that right side of the brain. Here's another diagram of a spec scan, and it's a measure of how much contrast has been taken up by parts of the brain that are active. In this particular diagram, the frontal lobe, which is right here, you can see the red at the top there and over here is red, the frontal lobe. That is where our willpower is and our compassion is and our ability to think in a reasonable way, not over control, but in a reasonable way. And after meditation, that frontal lobe is actually enhanced. If you have a stronger frontal lobe because of meditation, you're more able to withstand the emotional turmoil that can happen in the limbic system. I want to say a few words about mirror neurons, because this is another part of the brain that can be enhanced with spirituality. When you're in addiction mode, you're not paying attention to other people because it's all about self. You're closed and you're looking into yourself. When you're opening up into the larger world, paying attention to other people, making eye contact with other people, you're starting to experience the power of mirror neurons whenever there's social behavior. Mirror neurons allow me to connect to another person. You are talking with somebody and you're having a really good conversation, you'll notice that if you're leaning forward, that other person is starting to lean forward. When you're doing this, they'll start to do this. When your voice is getting raised, so will theirs. A mirroring process happens. This is something that we do to each other. This can be more highly activated in meditation. And the good news is if you're in a circumstance where somebody else is upset, yes, their upset will start to impact on you. But if you can, because you're aware of this, behave in a particular way, you might actually influence them. If you go, hey, wait a second, this person's upset. So I'm going to start to talk more slowly, lower voice taking deep breaths and that person, if they're connecting with me, will start to do the same. I will essentially be giving them the body cues. This isn't a conscious brain thing. You can manipulate on your behalf to help the other person. And you can do that for yourself. That's what meditation and prayer does. I can't not mention this information in a talk on addiction, recovery, because these are the talk of the internet. These are the talk of the latest research to help people in recovery. They're essentially tools to reach this spiritual domain. We're seeing more and more people using magic mushrooms or the ayahuasca drugs to help people get out of addiction. The concept is with the therapist, and I'm talking guided care, like two to three days of somebody there with you to guide you through your psychedelic experience. You'll be uplifted into a different realm, be able to look down, make different choices that you have made in the past or that you're going to make in the future. And from that vantage point, that when you come back down, you have a different resolve and a different perspective built in. That's the idea here. I'm not a fan of these approaches. I'm not convinced that they're long standing. I think that they're exciting. They'll teach us a lot about the brain. I much prefer the more nuanced, slower approach of using meditation, yoga, prayer, ritual, service. I think these approaches can make a fundamental change that is just as powerful, that is probably more powerful and more long-standing. In summary, I hope I've shown you how spirituality or faith does have a lot of research to support physical and mental well-being, specifically with addiction. Why? For one thing, it dampens the stress response, allows the parasympathetic relaxation response to flourish, which then allows the right brain its day in the sun. Because when you are stressed, that is dominant, and then the left brain is dominant, which is the rational part of ourselves, which is the non-spiritual part of ourselves. And once we're in that spiritual part of ourselves, ongoing, connection with serotonin and oxytocin can flourish 
And that's what makes a person feel good. That's why you would want to stay sober. Because remember, the addict is probably using to artificially get to that right side of the brain, which works for a short period of time and then doesn't. This way, you go to the right side of the brain, you get to stay there. Why would you need a drug if you can feel connected and satisfied and have a sense of meaning? That's the premise behind this. Taxation allows the right brain to flourish. That's your imagination, your intuition. Meditation will actually strengthen the frontal lobe in a way that it becomes a better servant, but not a master. It just becomes a better servant. And act, then you have access to things like the mirror neurons, where you can actually see the influence that you have and that others have on each other because we are essentially social beings. The biology of spirituality is far more than just talking about religion or even spiritual beliefs. It's about what it does to our body, how it enhances parts of our body that are normally neglected in drug use and alcoholism. You become a whole person within yourself and then within the larger community. I hope you found this talk useful and uplifting. And here's my oxytocin tip for the day. Thank you.